The first lesson is from the book of Exodus, chapter 16, verses 2 through 15. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as the frost of the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. In this reading, may we find God's words for us. Thanks be to God. The Gospel is from Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. The laborers in the vineyard. For the kingdom of heaven is not like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and, and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me 
for the usual daily wage. Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. In this reading, may we find the gospel of Christ. Praise be to you, O Christ. And now creating God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. And all of God's people said, Amen. Just a quick, a uh, couple of quick ads this morning. Uh, grateful for the music ministry of the Sanctuary Choir. Just to remind you that uh, the choir is still open. Uh, Deanna and Lee will be happy to have you join them. Uh, I guess they will be rehearsing again Tuesday week, uh, the Sanctuary Choir. The Gospel Choir, I think, will be singing on next Sunday, and they will be rehearsing this coming Thursday. Um, we really uh, embrace and celebrate the rich diversity of music uh, in the life and work of our worship. Georgia Osborne is back and will be doing a one-person show, uh, I believe, next Sunday and on October, and no Saturday. And no Saturday. Okay, and we're going to have Georgia say a word about it during coffee hour, uh, and, uh, but we look forward to uh, sharing in that. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? They were all there. They were all there at the memorial service at the Riverside Church on yesterday for actress and civil rights activist Ruby Dee, who encouraged and empowered so many with her words, with her acting, with her life. And we shared tears and laughter and stories and song and dance and gratitude for a full life, a life well lived. They were all there, fans and friends and family, and Sonia Sanchez and Alicia Keys and Lynn Whitfield and Felicia Rashad and Time Daly and Hera Belafonte and Wynton Marcellus and Peter of Peter Paul and Mary and many more. And we sang the songs of the movement. If I had a hammer, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. They were all there. And they were all there the week before at the Riverside Church for the New York Memorial Service, the poet, actress, activist Maya Angelou, who also died this year. This has been quite a season of loss and remembrance and gratitude. Ruby D. often said, the kind of beauty I want most is the hard to get kind that comes from within, strength and courage and dignity. And she said, the greatest gift is not being afraid to question. I like that. And she said, you just try to do everything that comes up. Get up an hour earlier, stay up an hour later, make the time, then you look back and say, well, that was a nice piece of juggling there. School, marriage, babies, career, the enthusiasms took me through the action, not the measuring of it or the reasonableness of it. And she said there was so much meanness in the atmosphere 
but marvelous things pierce through the darkness of poverty and racism. You meet all kinds of people that help put life in perspective and turn the horror into some kind of lesson or avenue of awakening that lives with you all your days. I was there for the memorial yesterday for Ruby D, but missed the memorial last week for Maya Angelou, but what big-hearted, gifted, creative geniuses and treasures we had in both Maya Angelou and Ruby D. Two quick stories, and I'm going to the scriptures. Someone said to Maya Angelou proudly and firmly, almost shouted it one day to her, I'm a Christian. I'm a born-again Christian. And she looked at them and quietly and simply asked, Already? She said, I'm trying to be a Christian. I am a practicing Christian, which is like trying to be a Jew or Muslim or Buddhist or Shintoist. For that matter, it's not a, something that you achieve, then sit back and be pleased about. It's something you're always striving for. In other words, our faith walk is really not so much about a destination, but about a journey, a pilgrimage. And we're all on it together. And yesterday at the memorial for Ruby D. Glenn Turman, who played Ruby D's song, A Son, in Raisin in the Sun, in his tribute said that Ruby D. often said to him, it's not who you know, but it is who knows you. He said he often thought about that, and it was so wonderful, and he felt so fortunate to have known the great Ruby D. But he said the greatest blessing was that Ruby D. knew him. Our faith walk is not so much about a destination, but about a journey, a pilgrimage. It's not who you know, but it's who knows you. And so maybe the first question is really not are we there yet, or who or what we know, but who knows us on the journey. This is really all I've come to remind us of this morning, that the big question of life is really not a question of there, but a question of who. Who do we know? But more importantly, who knows us? It's the question the scriptures speak to this morning. Whether well, if you've ever read the book of Exodus or not, if you've spent any time in church, you most likely know that the Israelites did a whole lot of grumbling and complaining out there in that wilderness. When they were on their way from slavery and captivity in Egypt to the land of freedom and promise in Canaan. The Bible says it was for 40 years they wandered in the wilderness. It was really a long trip. It seemed as if they would never get there. I like to imagine Moses and Aaron in the front seat of an old beat-up car, uh, you know, breaking down every few miles with no GPS, with all of the Israelites in the back seat chiming in together. When will we get there? When will we get there? How much longer? When will we get there? And I don't envy Moses and Aaron. They had taken on a really big job for God. They were trying to create something new. They were building a new nation, a new people. It was a paradigm shift. It was a cultural change, and people were having a hard time with it. They thought maybe they would be better off back in that familiar place of Egypt in slavery and captivity than out here in the middle of nowhere in the desert, in the wilderness. It was hard, hard, hard work leading a people. And I must confess this morning, friends, I sometimes feel like Aaron 
and Moses. Sometimes, of course, on a much smaller scale like the Roosevelt. I don't know whether you, you've had a chance to watch or see any of that wonderful PBS series and intimate history by Ken B Burns. It's a must-see. People so, the Roosevelt, so people of privilege and wealth, but so limited, so broken, so wounded, but rising up and sharing so much of themselves with others and the world and making a difference. It's not easy being a leader. It's not easy giving voice to a vision. It's not easy trying to act out the courage of your convictions. It's not easy trying to lead a people and to walk with the people to a new place, a new way of being, a new way of living, a new way of being church, not because the old way was wrong, but because this is a new day and a new time that demands a new way. We've taken on something really big here, Park Avenue Christian Church. It's a cultural change. It's a paradigm change. This is not just about building a new building, but it's about building a new community. It's about our risking what we are for what we can become. It's about building new mission and outreach. It's about reaching new people in ways we never dreamed possible before. It's about building our faith. It's about building our stewardship. A whole lot of grumbling and complaining going on. A whole lot of fear and anxiety going on. I'm not fussing this morning. I'm just talking this morning. Yes, like the Israelites of old, we are bewildered. We are bewildered by the times in which we live. Global warming and climate change, and we are terrified by diseases for which there are no cures. We're disappointed and frustrated by wars and violence in the Middle East and Asia and Africa, and even within our own borders and on our own city streets. We ask ourselves, when will it end? or even if it will ever end. Our own private and collective fears seem to be acted out in increasingly violent and volatile ways. Our public discourse about everything from education to immigration to justice and human rights is diminished and tainted by cynicism and mean-spiritedness that comes from virtually every direction. And so here we are in a wilderness of despair and desperation. But herein lies the great paradox. We in the wilderness, but there is a paradox here. Even in the wilderness, provision is made. Even in the wilderness, God is here. Even in the wilderness, we are not without help and hope. Even in the wilderness, every day, manna is provided. The Bible says it was like a coriander seed, white. Taste of it was like wafers made with honey. The name comes from the Hebrew manhu, which means, what is it? But if you go to, to the Sinai Peninsula today, it will not stay a mystery for very long. The Bedouin people who live there now still gather it and bake it into bread, which they still call manna today. The flakes themselves come from plant lice that feed on the local trees. Because the sap is poor in nitrogen, the bugs have to eat a lot of it in order to live. They excrete the extra in a yellowish white flake or ball of juice from, from the tree that is rich in carbohydrates and sugars. It decays quickly and it attracts ants. So a daily portion is the most anyone can gather at one time. 
That's the reason it had to be gathered every day. It didn't last very long. It was very transitory. Some people of faith reject this explanation because they think it takes away from the miracle of manna. But I wonder about that. Does manna have to come out of nowhere in order to qualify for a miracle? Or is the miracle that God heard the complaining of hungry people? God provided coriander seed and fed them with bug juice, with food it would never have occurred to them to eat. Or to put it another way, as Barbara Brown Taylor says it, what makes something bread from heaven? Is it the thing itself, or is it the one who sent it? Is it the thing itself, or is it the one who sends it? How you answer that question has a lot to do with how you sense God's presence in your life. If your manna has to drop down straight out of heaven, looking like a perfect loaf of buttered crusted bread, uh, already toasted, then chances are you're going to go hungry a whole lot. Uh, when you do not get the miracle you're praying for, you're going to think that God is ignoring you or punishing you or worse, that God is not there. You're going to start comparing yourself to other people and wondering why they seem to have more to eat than you do. And you may even start complaining to heaven about that. Meanwhile, you're going to miss a whole lot of things. God is doing for you because they are too ordinary, they are too common, they are too everyday, like bug juice, or transitorial, or like manna, that fine, flaky substance that melted as soon as the sun got hot. If on the other hand, you're willing to look at everything that comes to you from God, there will be no end to the manna in your life. A can of beans will be manna. The sunrise, the sunset, a simple smile from a rider on the subway, the rain that falls, buck juice will be manna. Nothing will be ordinary or too transitory to remind you of who God is. When you go to bed hungry at night, wake up to find a fine, flaky substance on the ground, you will say, what is it? And when someone says, this is bread that the Lord has given you to eat, you know what? You will believe it. You will say, thanks be to God, and start trying to figure out how to eat the stuff. Because it's not what it is that counts, but it's who said it. I think I'm preaching this morning. And the miracle is that God is always sending us something to eat, even in the wilderness. Day by day, God is made known to us in the simple things that sustain our lives. Some bread, some love, some breath, some health, some strength, some healing, some joy. What a generous God we serve who not only gives us necessary things, but beautiful things. What a generous God we serve, who not only blesses us with what we pray for, but gives us wonderful things that far exceed anything that we could ever ask or think. What a generous God we serve, who not only fills our cup, but makes it overflow, adding love to life, adding beauty to duty, grace to space, joy to time. God's blessings are new every morning, fresh every evening, and present in every situation. And so we must never become so familiar with God that we put God in the straitjacket of our own righteousness, our own morality and expectations. That's what Jesus reminds us in that parable that Margie shared with the children, the workers in the vineyard that we heard George read, God has the freedom, power to go beyond what you and I think is reasonable and right and just. God does not love us fairly or justly, but God loves us lavishly, passionately, persistently, madly, boldly, extravagantly, with abandon, with overflowing 
overwhelming generosity. And love is much better than fairness. Fairness is equal. Love is extravagant. Fairness measures out portions. Love gives all. Fairness knows when to stop. Love gives without restraint. Fairness uses a calculator. Love is infinite. Thanks be to God. God is not fair with us, but God is loving. Aren't you glad about it? And when we come to know that we've been called and claimed by overflowing love, unending love, abundant love, a love where nothing can separate us from that love, we can share it with others. We can have a concern for and commitment to the poor, the least, the last, the lost, the locked out, the left behind. We can care for our children, all of our children. We can have a tolerance and acceptance and affirmation, a celebration of people who don't look like us, who don't act like us, even those who don't share our values. We can minister to the homeless. We can feed the hungry. We can help the hurting. We can encourage the hopeless. We can invite all together at God's welcome table. No, we're not there yet. We're on a journey. And yes, we know the one who walks with us. But even more, we know that one knows us. Thanks be to God. Thank you.